Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode of the Live Facebook, A Journey Through Ideology. I want to remind the viewers that this show is especially to prove and discuss the five principles of monotheism, which is basically what the whole religion of Islam is based upon. Um, we did prove the existence of God in previous episodes, so if you want to uh, look at how our esteemed guest does prove the existence of God, then you can go ahead and watch those videos. Uh, last week we looked into the chapter of Tawheed, which is the first principle that uh, our esteemed guests would like to look at. And inshallah, this week we will look at the second part of the chapter of Tawheed in the book Haqq al uh, by Sayyid Abdullah Shabbar. Before I welcome on our esteemed guests, I would like to send our deepest condolences to the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, for the uh, death of Imam al Jawad and Imam al Baqir alayhi salam. But without further ado, I'd like to welcome one our esteemed guest, Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Panju. Sheikh, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. How are you? Uh, alhamdulillah wa shukran. Alhamdulillah. As always, it's an uh, honor to be with you uh, for the show. Thank you very much. So, Sheikh, last week we began the discussion on the correct understanding of Tawheed. And we were dissecting and analyzing the hadith of Amir al muminin alayhi salam, narrated by Sheikh al Saduq in the Kitab, Kitab al Tawheed. And the hadith outlines four possible meanings of Tawheed. Two of which are correct and two are incorrect. Yeah. So, Sheikh, can you go further into this? Absolutely. Um, this is, I guess, where we had begun the discussion towards the end of the show last week. Mm, yeah. And one thing that we can take straight off the bat is that when we as monotheists, Muslims, Shia, when we say that we believe in the oneness of God, or we believe in the concept of Tawheed, this in itself is not sufficient. Okay. As a claim, this is not sufficient. When I say I believe in one God, the entire discussion, the hadith of Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam, which is narrated by Sheikh Saduq, which we are discussing, is revolving around understanding the terminology or the definition of this three-letter word, one. Mm. What does it mean when you say God is one? Yeah, sure. This is the entire basis upon the discussion of this hadith. For Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam says, there are four possible meanings of the word tawheed. Mm. Yani when you say God is one. Two of these understandings are incorrect. And two of these understandings are correct. Mm -hmm. So you can begin to understand the depth which is required when we come and we say, God is one. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. For example, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. This shahada, the primary basis upon which our entire deen revolves, what does it mean? Course. A deep understanding, which is what Amir al-Mu'minin points towards. So as we were discussing last week, you find over here, Amir al-Mu'minin says, فَأَمَّا اللَّذَانْ لَا يَجُوزَانْ عَلَيْهِ فَقَوْلُ الْقَائِلِ The two understandings of Tawheed which are incorrect yeah. are as follows. وَاحِدْ يَقْصُدْ بِهِ بَابُ الْإِعْدَادِ فَهَذَا مَا لَا يَجُوزُ He says, if your understanding of Tawheed, when you say God is one, mm. is exclusive to a numerical understanding yeah. of the word one, yani looking at the number one from a numerical perspective, if yeah. this is my understanding of God, he says it's incorrect. Okay. Why? Because numerically speaking, one can be multiplied. Mm-hmm. From one, you are able to add another one in order to gain two. And add one to get to three. And add one to get to four. And so on and so forth. For Amir al-Mu'minin establishes through this tradition that the numerical understanding of the number one cannot be restricted in our understanding of Tawheed. Tawheed is something much more deeper. As we will come to understand from the two dimensions that are acceptable. Okay. But this is one which is incorrect. The other one he says, 
وقولل قائل هو واحد من الناس يريد به النوع من الجنس okay now you find over here that this is an introduction to the science of logic because of the terminologies that are used basically amir al mu'minin alayhi salam says the understanding of the word one tawhid oneness cannot be from the dimension of a jinns or the dimension of a naw so uh, ascribing male female to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not necessarily okay um jinns linguistically speaking yes mm. male and female correct however in the science of logic yeah. the word naw and the word jinns applies to a definition which is regarded as the genus or the species mm -hmm. so when you come into the world of logic the science of logic you find that within the books of islamic logic there is a chapter which is known as kulliyatul khamsa mm -hmm. kulliyatul khamsa yani it's a field of logic that talks and discusses about the five universal concepts that exist okay five universal concepts it could be you can replace the word concept with the word universal realities okay. or universal truth wow so anything which is a concept or a truth or a reality in itself five major universal or the five universal concepts truths or realities now before we delve into this uh, definition you find that within these universal realities with the jinns and the now the species and the genus this is the species as a universal concept is a type of reality Yeah. a type of concept whereby by definition a now for example al kulli alladhi kanat afraduhu muttafiqa fil haqiqa wa kana huwa tamam haqiqati afradih mithl insan by way example so a universal concept like for example the human being yeah the human being this definition human being is a universal concept sure as a universal concept there are many individuals that resemble or impersonate this reality so for example, for example under human beings you have ali you have zaid you have hasan you have murtada you have minhal you have amir rida you have so on so forth okay each one of us are human beings we may differ in secondary attributes mm -hmm. such as color length height so okay. on so forth but our reality as a reality is one that we're human beings sure so you have a concept known as human beings a universal concept whose manifestation or impersonation is actualized through multiple human beings okay Understood? So you're putting it into subtopics basically. Subcategories you Sub -categories. can say. Subcategories, okay. Categor yeah, not yeah. categories but manifestations. Fair enough. Okay, yeah. Manifestations. Yeah. Got you, got you. you have a concept known as the concept of the human beings. Mm -hmm. The manifestation of these human beings are through the different number of individuals such as you and I. Fair enough. Right? Jinns on the other hand is another type of universal concept or reality. Mm -hmm. The genus okay the manifestation of this universal concept is different in essence so for example the terminology of the term mammal mammal the mammal is a universal concept however the impersonation or the manifestation of the term mammal is through a different number of beings or realities that are in essence different from each other oh. so for example under a mammal you have the example of a cow mm. you have the example of a camel you also have the example of a human being yeah oh yeah but the reality of the human being 
from the reality of the camel and the reality of the cow is totally different even though they all come under one universal concept known as Mammal. mammals. Now, Kulliyat al-Khamsa, these definitions, by the way, I have taken them from, this is Bain al uh between the brackets. I've taken these from the uh, book, A Summary into the Science of Logic, mm -hmm. uh, which was authored by Sayyid al-Marja, uh, Ayatollah al-Udma, Sayyid Sadiq al-Shirazi. Mm -hmm. uh, Hafidahullah, may Allah grant him and all our virtuous maraja a long and a healthy life. Inshallah. And... Uh, uh, you know, an interesting uh, point on this is that Sayyid al-Marja had authored this book in the very early days of his life while he was in Karbala al-Muqaddas. This is before moving to Kuwait and then from Kuwait on to uh, Qum. Oh wow, he moved to Kuwait first. And he moved to Kuwait first and uh, this was uh, due to the uh, pressures and due to the... Uh, uh, threat that was imposed on them by the Ba'ath regime. Oh, I see. As you know, the uh, family, the, the Bayt al-Shiraziyah, the house of the Marja'iyah, was very active from Karbala in uh, not only being uh, the source of global Marja'iyah, but when it came to implementing the teachings of Islam. Mm. So, for example, from an economic perspective, from oh, a see. political perspective, from a social perspective, mm -hmm. there was a lot of communist influence that was coming in. Oh, there was a lot of yeah. dictatorial rule that was coming in, mm -hmm. for example. And because the house of the Sayyid um, opposed this type of uh, injustice uh, upon the people of Iraq, they were seen as a threat towards the regime and uh, they were forced uh, into exile. But uh, Sayyid al-Marja had written this book, an introduction or a summary into the science of logic during his very young age. Now, before we go on to the completion of this hadith, um, you know, a sub-discussion that mm. sprouts out from this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes the viewer might, might be sitting across, tuning in, listening to this discussion and might say, well, all these terminologies don't really make sense to me. Kulliyat al-Khamsa and yeah. no and jains yeah. and using the species as a human being and subcategories. Where is all this leading to? The point over here is to, to try and make us understand the importance of the science of logic in our lives. Mm -hmm. What is the importance of logic? What does logic actually mean? Fair enough. <laughs> Many times we make disastrous decisions in regards to our life, in regards to our religion, because we do not understand, number one, and number two, we do not implement the principles of logic in our thought process. Yeah. And you find that logic, logic actually by definition is what? It's a science. Mm -hmm that allows us to formulate the right arguments right in order to deduce the right conclusions okay yeah, the yeah. right manner the right way in which we formulate arguments mm -hmm. the right way in which we arrange these arguments in order to deduce a correct conclusion this is uh, in summary, the definition of the science of logic. Mm -hmm. People don't understand this. In this day and age, people think that whatever makes sense to me is logic. Ya akhi, this is wrong. Who said this is the definition of logic? Wow. And I have seen in my time disastrous decisions okay. that are made in the field of tabligh mm -hmm. by people claiming to use logic when they have aslan nothing to do with nothing when it comes to logic. Oh wow, okay. Yeah, two examples. This is just by the way to show us the importance for myself, Habibi Minhal for yourself, for our mushahideen, the importance of studying logic when it comes to understanding decisions or taking stances, be it in religion be it in our personal lives, be it in our business lives, be it in our political stances that we take. Mm -hmm. 
Now I remember in one of the centers that I was serving, a person came, and these were people from the idara, huh? These okay. are people from management. All right. And he comes and he says, Shaykhuna, for example, Shaykhuna, this marasim that we have, for example, at the end of uh, uh, majlis for the, the, the muhadara, the istishad, the programs for the istishad of Ahlul yeah, Bayt, yeah, yeah. why should we have the shabih of a tabut, for example? You know, in our majalis and in the culture of Ahlul Bayt and in the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, to simulate mm. historical realities is something which is necessary. Of course. And is something which is encouraged. Yep. So they used to come and say, why should we have a tabut, the replica of a tabut, and then people come and touch it and kiss it for baraka when it represents nothing but, you know, it's just a replica. It okay. means nothing. Okay. This is something more cultural. We're taking people backwards. We should get rid of it. I said to him, get rid of it. Why? He says, logically, it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> he played ya the akhi, logic card. <laughs> he played the logic card. Ya akhi, before you say logically, it doesn't make sense. Enter ya janab. Let me ask you, what is the definition of logic? See, the people use, use logic. Sometimes you, they use words. I mean, everyday people. They, they will use words they don't know the meaning of and they expect you to understand what they mean. So be like, logically, right. that doesn't make sense. You ask him, what's the definition of logic? He'll be like, I don't know. Ah, son. <laughs> so what has happened is we've started using the word logic to what makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. This is an injustice on the term logic in itself. Yeah. Or logic yani, has become another term for my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Hence, it becomes very important. And this is the same thing when it comes to debates. Debates about imama, deba debates about tawheed of Allah Azza wa Jal, or it's not a logical argument. Like, for example, the argument of the atheist, where when you say, ah, the existence of God or saying that God is the superpower is not logical because it forces us to live life by a set of rules. Mm. This is a, a very uh, common Argument, yeah. rebuttal that is put out by the atheist. What is the definition of logic mm. that you are using in order to deduce this conclusion? Fair point. Logic is a science that teaches us how to formulate arguments, organize those arguments in a manner that is correct in order to deduce the correct conclusions, mm -hmm. a mental process in which there are guidelines, yeah. in which there are rules, and there are regulations. Mm -hmm. Which is why we say to the people, it's extremely important to study the science of logic, even generally, not only from the field of religion, but as individuals ourselves. So you find over here that when Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam says that when we say God is one, but not one from the aspect of a universal context, concept like a jinns or a no a species or a genus why because the word human being is one mm -hmm. the concept human being does it apply to any other creation except for no just human beings just yeah. human beings so the term and this is what amir mu'minin is pointing towards the term human being is one is applicable only on one but the manifestations of human beings are how many? Multiple. Of course. Six billion of us. Seven point, nearly eight. Nearly eight. <laughs> ah, Santo, six, eight, eight billion of us. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is an important point over here. Ya'ani, the oneness of Allah, the reality of Allah Azza wa Jal is one reality. And that reality, the manifestation of that reality cannot be captured through multiplicity. Uh -huh. Because there is a philosophical concept that also tries to talk about the oneness of God, mm -hmm. but oneness of God through multiplicity. I see. So for example, they say there is one philosophical concept uh, it comes forward and it says that each and every one of us, mm -hmm. everything within the creation, 
is a manifestation of the reality of that one God. Yani God is one. Baba, they don't come and tell you that God is five or ten. No, no, no. no they no. don't say God is two or three. La Tawheed. It says God is one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the essence of God mm. is manifested through each and every one of us. Each mm. and every one of us has a part of that one God. Is that a certain religion that says that? This is a thought which is propagated within Islam. Oh, okay. This okay, is a okay. thought. Because I, there's, there's another religion out there that yeah. says um, that they believe everyone on this earth, including animals, a anything, anything, right. is part, is actually what, exactly what you're saying right now. Ahsantum. They have the, this, uh, these are thoughts, and inshallah, if we have a, a program that uh, focuses on particular this aspect of Tawheed. Mm -hmm. You will find that we have a lot of Greek philosophy mm -hmm. and a lot of Muslim scholars, philosophers were influenced by this Greek philosophy when it came to understanding the concept of Tawheed. Wow. So you find that these are ancient philosophies, they're not anything new. Mm -hmm. And you have a number of Muslim philosophers. Ya Akhi, we have more than that, we have a number of Shia Wow. Scholars who believe in the multiplicity of God that is a representation or a denotation of his oneness. Wow. And the term is unity through multiplicity. Wow, okay. Now, if we were just to stop here, unity through multiplicity, let us look at it again from the science of logic. Mm -hmm. Can you have the concept of unity and the concept of multiplicity. Two opposing concepts. Okay. Two totally conflicting concepts. A, a single unit cannot be a multiple unit at the same of time. Of course not, no. A multiple unit cannot be a single unit at the day, same mm -hmm. time. So how can you have two conflicting concepts come together to be one. True, true, very true. Multiplicity negates unity and unity negates multiplicity. So two concepts that essentially negate each other, can they be considered to be one? No. Can you call them polytheistic Muslims? <laughs> you will be surprised. Because the Prophet was against 365 idols. Yeah, but yeah. when you say the manifestation of God or the unity of God is manifested through multiplicity and each and every one of us has a part of Allah within us, the Prophet condemned those people who had 360 idols in the Kaaba. Mm -hmm. This guy, Ya Subhanallah, has come and created 6 million loads. <laughs> because each and every one of us is supposed to be a part of Allah. Astaghfirullah. Ahshantum. For the concept of Tawheed, mm -hmm. yani, it is not sufficient for mm -hmm. a person to come and say, Oh, Tawheed and Allah is one. And hence, anything and everything that comes out from his mouth is gospel and that's something we should submit to. La! What is meant by Tawheed? What is meant by the number one oneness mm -hmm. of Allah Azza wa Jal? So is that like, for example, Christian, the religion of Christianity when they say, in the Quran, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ مَنْ قَالَ اللَّهُ ثَالِثُ الثَّلَاثُ Something like that? Right. So is that, is that the same way? Is that they're trying to manifest Allah in a Holy Spirit, in a Father, in a Son? It is a form of manifestation of on one hand. On the other hand, ahsant, it's mm. more of multiplicity. Yeah, yeah, manifestation yeah. is different. Manifestation in that that, that of Allah Azza wa Jal mm -hmm. is manifest within each and every one of us. Okay. With what we are able to understand, or what I am able to understand, the multiplicity of God, which is talked about over here, that one becomes into three, or the divisibility of three, of one into three parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This in itself is also marfud. This is something which is rejected in itself over there. So you find over here that Amirul Mu'minin, Salamullahi Alayhi, when he speaks about the two aspects of Tawheed mm. that are incorrect, the first one is the one that is exclusive from a numerical figure, and number two, 
the fact that when we say God is one, in that he belongs to or the oneness of God is not from the category of a universal concept mm -hmm. that has multiple manifestations. Okay. Like for example, the most simplest way to say it is one of a kind. Yeah. The expression one of a kind. Mm -hmm. If my understanding is that when I say God is one, but with the understanding one of a kind, that understanding is incorrect. Mm -hmm. So these are two aspects of Tawheed that are incorrect. Coming to the two aspects of Tawheed that are correct, mm -hmm. you find that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam makes the clarification. Yep. أَمَّا الْوَجْحَانَ أَلَّذَانْ يُثْبِتَانْ فِيهِ فَقَوْلُ الْقَائِلِ هُوَ وَاحِدٌ لَيْسَ لَهُ فِي الْأَشْيَاءِ شَبِيحٌ كَذَلِكَ رَبُّنَا The aspect of Tawheed, when we say God is one, which is correct, is the understanding that God is one. وَاحِدٌ لَيْسَ لَهُ فِي الْأَشْيَاءِ شَبِيحٌ there is nothing that can resemble Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the meaning of one. This is the meaning of one. Okay. So in this sense over here, unique. One mm. in the sense that unique. This one God, there is no other entity, no other concept, nothing else that can be like him mm -hmm. or that can be used to understand him. This is taken from the verse of the Quran, Laysa kamithlihi shay. There is nothing like him, nothing kaf for, for uh, shibh or shabi. Mm -hmm. There is nothing like him, yeah, yeah, yeah. meaning that. You cannot use any other concept or any other sort of understanding to understand him, Azza wa Jal. <laughs> Subhanallah, wow. Dumbfounded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> baffles the intellect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sahih? Because the intellect is baffled, we submit to his grandeur. We're limited. Our brains are limited. We can't understand Allah. Like and this is very uh, important to understand the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen such that we do not enter into any form of deviated understanding of Tawheed. Ahsantum, Shaykhna. Shaykhna, thank you very much. Inshallah, uh, after the break, we'll go into the two accepted versions uh, in the understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'd like to remind the viewers, if you do want to send in your questions to the Shaykh, uh, the number is down below on your screen and inshallah we'll see you in the next segment. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the second segment of the Life Faith Book, a journey through ideology where we're looking at the second um, the second episode of the chapter of Tawheed. So Shaykhna, before the break, you were talking about the two uh, concepts of Tawheed which are not accepted. Right. Now you were going on to, so you touched a little bit upon the two that are accepted. Right. Shaykhna, I just wanted, I wanted to ask you uh, from a personal perspective. You said that one of a kind is not accepted. Right. But then you talked how uh, in the ones that are accepted, unique right. being accepted. For the viewers out there, some may say, some may argue that unique is the same or has the same interpretation as one of a kind. Right. So do you want to distinguish between those two points? Sure. So what is understood over here is that if you are using the word unique, 
it all boils down to definition of the words that we are using. Okay. If I am using the understanding that God is one unique in that one of a kind unique, then yes, this is incorrect. Uh -huh. But when I use the word unique in the context that Laysa Kamitli Shay, there is nothing like him mm -hmm. in that this one reality, this one Allah, the essence of this one God is something that Aslan cannot be understood through any sort of example. Mm. Through any sort of likeliness, okay. that one which is the ultimate one, that unique in the true sense of the meaning, unique, that this oneness cannot be understood through one of any other kind, and ah. the uniqueness that cannot be understood through any other unique uh, identity so for example, or if entity. There's, if there's one of a kind car, you can still understand that this is a car made of this, 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 this. When you say one of a kind car, there are many other cars that exist, but this one is. Uh, but you can still understand the car, if, even if it's one of a kind. Uh -huh. You can still understand what it is, you what can, it's made of. You can understand what it is, you can understand what it is made of, but mm -hmm. that understanding is incorrect if it is applied to Allah. Uh -huh, when ahead. you say the car is one of a kind, Yes, it might be a car better than all other cars. Mm -hmm. It may be a car which is the best of all cars. Mm -hmm. The problem is not in the best. The problem is not in that it is the most supreme. The problem is that you have compared that car and put that car mm -hmm. in comparison to other cars. Fair that enough. comparison in itself is inaccurate. If you want to apply it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you want to apply to Allah okay, subhanahu yeah, yeah, yeah. wa ta'ala. In fact, this discussion just brought something into my mind. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is a hadith from Kitabul Kafi, yeah. Shaykh Al Kulaini, rahmatullah alayh. And um, it goes along the lines where the blessed Imam is asked in regards to the meaning of Allahu Akbar. Okay. What does Allahu Akbar mean? Allah is greater than. We usually translate it and we say that Allah is the greatest. Mm -hmm. But Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater than. So the Imam asked him, Allah is greater than what? He said, Allah is greater than everything that can be perceived. Or everything that there is in the world, everything that can be perceived. The Imam said, Baba, the understanding is incorrect of Tawheed. He said, that in itself, you have committed a type of polytheism. Yeah. Ajeeb. He said, why? When you say Allah is greater than everything else, the fact that you are comparing him yeah. to other things, even though you acknowledge his greatness, but that greatness is acknowledged at the expense of comparing him with other things. This in itself is inaccurate. It's injustice to Allah. Subhanallah. Allah is greater than to be comprehended. Wow. This is the meaning of Tawheed. Wow. This is the meaning of Allahu Akbar. Mm -hmm. Ya Habibi, Takbiratul Ahram. Is the iftitahus salat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, if my iftitahus salat, the understanding of the phrase Allahu Akbar is incorrect. Ya Akhi, who am I praying to? <laughs> what am I praying to? Subhanallah. So, see, yani, Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam, how daqiq and Very. how precise he is Very. when it comes to the understanding of Tawheed. Mm -hmm. So, the First aspect of the Tawheed is that Ammal Wajhan Alladhan Yuthbitan Fihi Fakawlul Ka'il Huwa Wahid Laysa Lahu Fil Ashya Shabih There is no comparison, there is nothing similar to, nothing that can be compared to Allah. Meaning that even when we want to stand, understand Allah Azza wa Jal, we cannot use examples of yeah. Things or realities or entities or concepts that exist in order to understand Allah. This is wrong because la shabiha lahu. I remember there are so many, and you know, it is also important for our madrasa teachers mm -hmm. to understand this because sometimes when we teach tawhid to the younger children, yani, how are we? Uh, uh, understanding? How are we teaching them? How are we making them understand tawhid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ani, I remember. <coughs> Excuse me, in one of the madaris that I was involved, I come across one of the uh, uh, 
exams or the tests mm -hmm. that we're talking about Tawheed. And uh, the student comes and writes that um, understanding the relationship between the creator and the creation, mm. that they are two separate entities and one is the creator and one is the creation, but the relationship between the creator and the creation is like the white part and the yolk of the egg. Yani, the white part and the yolk, both of them are separate. It's not what they used to teach. Yani, oh, this is one, okay, what okay. one of the answers that the student wrote. Okay, 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 he said okay. that the relationship between the creator and the created is like the egg, where you have the whiteness of the egg and you have the yolk of the egg. Okay. The creator is separate from the creation, just like the way the yolk is separate from the whiteness, but all in all, they come under one. Yani, the unity between the, or the relationship between the creator and the created. This was the answer of the student, Ajib. What was even more strange than that was the comment of the teacher. Very good analogy. You blame the teacher, you blame the student. You, don't know who to you blame. want to use the example and you want to understand Allah Azza wa Jal by comparing him to the yolk of an egg. Shunai, <laughs> maskhara. So we have to understand the Tawheed in the right manner. Same thing. But how, how would someone answer that? How would someone answer the relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His creation? The Creator mm. is separate from the creation. Okay. The Creator is responsible for bringing the creation into existence, but the that, the essence of Allah Azza wa Jal, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ In fact, we have got hadith that prohibit us, prohibit us to speak about the essence of God. Wow. Because it is misleading. You are entering into a realm which the human mind cannot comprehend. Which is why you find that in the beginning of this entire text, from the hadith of Ahlul Bayt and from the verses of the Quran. How did we understand Allah Azza wa Jal? None of these verses when we were proving the existence of God, none of them came to prove the existence of God by trying to understand the that yeah. of Allah, the essence of true. Allah. True, true, it true, was true. about understanding Allah from His actions and through the traces of His creation. We understand Allah through his sifat, not through his that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ancient Greek philosophers tried to understand God through their essence, and this is where they fell. Mm. A lot of Muslim philosophers tried to understand Allah through his essence, through the that, and this is where they have failed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And have come up with deviating theories. Yeah, and you find that this is in addition to the hadith, if I'm not mistaken, by Imam Rida, alayhi salam, alayhi that he... Uh, explicitly rejects and prohibits any one of his companions to speak about the thought of Allah Azza wa wow. No? Understand him to the sifat. So you have, our discussion was uh, in regards to la shabiha lahu, laysa kamithlihi shay. There is nothing like him. This is the first understanding of Tawheed which is correct. Correct. Second one. Number two. وَقَوْلُ الْقَائِلِ أَنَّهُ رَبُّنَا أَحَدِيُّ الْمَعْنَى He is one in meaning. يَعْنِي بِهِ أَنَّهُ لَا يَنْقَسِمْ فِي وُجُودِ وَلَا أَكْلِ وَلَا وَحْمِ كَذَلِكَ رَبُّنَا In that Allah is one, this one which is Undivisible in its understanding and its meanings. Sure. Okay. One which cannot be divided is undivisible. Mm. Allah Azza wa Jal is not this one, or it's not one which is composed, or com uh, is not composed of, is not made up of multiple parts. Okay. Sometimes you can have multiple parts that get together to form one. Mm -hmm. For example, in the minhal, you are one. Yeah. I Your hope. body I hope. is one, <laughs> inshallah. <laughs> the body is one, yeah. but you as an individual are made up of a number of limbs. Yeah. 
your right hand, your left hand, your right leg, your left leg, your two ears, your head, your nose, your everything. On top of this, this one minhal is made up of a number of organs interior in, uh, in its interior yep. that all work together towards your functioning. Yep. You are made up of a number of organs and limbs collectively that make you one. And now we say, when we say Allah is one, Azzawajal, the understanding of one is that he is not made up of components. Uh-huh. is not made up of different aspects that when put together, compose or compromise or make up this one. Mm-hmm. He's not made up of divisible entity, entities. I see, I see, I see. There is a logical conclusion for this. Mm. For the human being, the body, which is one, is dependent, as we said, on multiple limbs and multiple organs. Yep. In order for this one body to function, this one body to function, it is dependent on the limbs and the organs to function correctly. And they are dependent on something else. And they are dependent on something else. Ahsantum. And that's dependent on something and it keeps going. <laughs> there is a chain of dependency. Yeah. To say that this one is dependent on the components that make it up in order to function or to exist. This means this load is dependent on something. Yeah. If the load is dependent, yani he is not ghani. Yeah. He is not all powerful. Of course. And from the sifat of Allah Azza wa Jal is that he is all powerful. So... The essence or the meaning that he is all-powerful is nullified if my understanding of God is that he is made up of a number of components Mm -hmm. and a number of parts that are put together to form this one. So a one in which there is no other likeliness, there is no other resemblance a one that is not composed of different components that is indivisible or undivided is this one. Yeah, 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 Understanding sure. of Tawheed. Hello. This is from the hadith of Amir al-Mu'min alayhi salam. Shaykhna, there's, um, I have some questions coming in through WhatsApp right here. Uh, Sarah from Canada says, uh, what is your advice to anyone who doesn't believe in God? Right. So you talked about, last week uh, I believe, or the week before you said that someone who says I don't believe in anything is actually a contradiction because you're believing that you don't believe in something. So what's your advice on someone who doesn't believe in God? A person who doesn't believe in God, my question to them would be reverse the question. Why should you not believe in God? Reverse the question to them. When they come and they tell you I don't believe in God, sit them down and ask them, why don't you believe in God? Some people say, I don't, I don't want to believe in, a, in something I can't obviously fulfill with my five senses. Right. And, you know, how can I just believe that there's just some sort of higher power there? Right. That I can't communicate with, I can't see, I can't, you know. Who said we can't communicate with them? Well, we can communicate with them. And like the way Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam said, you don't see them with your eyes. You can't see Allah with your eyes, but you can see Him with your heart. Mm-hmm. The person came and asked Amir al salam can, lo- can you see your Lord? Amir al salam said, how do you expect me to worship a Lord that I cannot see? They said, Ya Amir al you see your Lord with your eyes? Amir al said, why hag? He said, woe be upon you. I didn't mean that I see Him with my eyes. I see Him through my heart. Yeah, yeah. Yani His existence is so manifest through the creation that I cannot deny his existence and his grandeur and his power. What I would say to the sister is two things. Number one, contemplate over the creation of this universe Mm -hmm. and ask yourself how did all of this come into existence? Mm -hmm. More than that, look at your own existence, your own body. And my advice would be refer back to Kitab Tawheed Al Mufaddal mm-hmm. by Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Tawheed Al Mufaddal. Look at the beauty with which your body was created and then ask yourself, why was I created? Yeah. If you can do these three things, 
your natural fitrah will take you towards the belief of God. Again. This is my answer for the sister. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Sheikh, is there anything you want to add before we end? Uh, Tayyib, uh, inshallah, next week we will talk about uh, how the Imam used the hadith to show that uh, you can only have one God rather than two gods. And uh, this is an uh, important aspect for us to discuss before we enter into the sifat of Allah Azza wa Jal. Definitely, definitely. Ahsentum, Shaykhna. Uh, I'd like to thank the viewers for tuning in and I'd like to thank the Shaykh for taking the time out of his day to sit with us and discuss the chapter of Tawheed, the second part. Uh, stay tuned for next week's episode because I'm very excited for it. Inshallah, you are. And inshallah, we will see you next week. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.